want to welcome you to the Reformed Informants. This is a podcast devoted to biblical exposition, systematic theology, and practical application for the good of the church. I'm Lance Burroughs, along with TJ Darty, and we are the Reformed Informants. I don't even know what people are supposed to talk about at the beginning of every episode. Like I thought about we're that around too. like episode thirty or so. Um, and there are others that are in the hundreds. Yeah. I mean, what? I don't what, know. What do you intro with every time? Well, should we just go straight into the biblical content and have no personality? <laughs> do we make a joke? Do we talk about life? I don't know. Maybe some listener feedback would be helpful. How's the weather there in te- you know, I, yeah, I, I, don't, I don't have any yeah, idea. Do you small talk your way through the beginning? It's a good I, question. We might have to actually talk about the weather right now. It's blazing out. Yeah, I heard tomorrow's supposed to be even, even worse. Is it really? That's what I heard. I just got back from a college retreat in Broken Bow, Oklahoma, and it was over 100 degrees every day, and the humidity was like 300%. <laughs> <laughs> Oh man, that's ministry. Yep. That's laying laying it all down. Sanctification. <laughs> oh my goodness, it was necessary. Okay, man. Well, we are uh, beginning a new series today. I think at least on the episode guide and the episode outlines, uh, we've set aside two episodes uh, to cover this next uh, category in systematic theology. Uh, could possibly, as always, add another one if we feel it's necessary. Uh, we'll see. We'll kind of play that by ear. Um, but TJ, why don't you take us through um, kind of the timeline of series that we've done and how they're all connected to our latest series here on homardiology. Yeah, so um, I like how you mentioned this is all connected. You know, we're building a systematic theology. We're walking through Scripture, and we're trying to, um, you know, if you're new to the podcast, we, we're we're building a system of, of theology. We're building a um, cohesive unit of thought that um, adequately handles all of the biblical texts. And so we began with a series on bibliology, looking at what the Bible says, um, the authority, sufficiency of Scripture, those types of things, inerrancy, inspiration, uh, the canonization, all of the things related to the Bible. Then we shifted to look at theology proper. That's the Trinity, the person of God, the, the work of God, specifically focusing on the Father. Then we shifted into anthropology. So that's the study of man. Um, and if you've listened to those three series, you, you'll understand that this is a direct connection and link into the homardiology series. Uh, because we're talking about man, that leads us to talk about homardiology. Now, what is, we've used the word several times, what is homardiology? Uh, homardiology is the uh, study of sin. So it is, I mean, you can't break the chain between anthropology and homardiology. Exactly. We just finished up talking about man. Now we're talking about sin. Those, these things, these doctrines, these categories are connected. You cannot have one without the other. And this is the proper order. Right. Uh, to, to roll with him. And well, this and is... No, go ahead. Well, especially because the last... When we looked at the doctrine of man, anthropology, we looked at the overview of man, then we looked at the image of God, and then we looked at the fall of man, the depravity of man, right? Like the, the state of man uh, prior to the fall, but also after the fall and the effects of the fall on man. And so naturally, you start talking about the fall, well, now you have to talk about sin. Right. They're just interrelated. They're interconnected. You can't... Um, you can't do one without the other and vice versa. Yeah. And I mean, this is the Reformed Informants podcast. The the systematic theology is kind of the driving force behind the podcast. We want to open up the Word of God and we want to systematize it. We want to have it organized where uh, we can understand it um, in a clear cut way. So that's why we're using the order that we're using. TJ is kind of the driving force behind that. Um, It's not true. I just throw in my two cents every now and then on the order here. Um, uh, Don't believe him. Yeah, bel- believe me. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, so the, 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 this is kind of the movement of our podcast. That's what we're wanting to do. And if you've been following, you get that. Or Again, like I said at the beginning here, we're about 30 episodes in, and we have many more uh, to work through until we get to the end of systematizing. Right, right? And, and I loved what you, you've said this. I think you said it in one of our earliest episodes, maybe even the first one, and it's really stuck with me. I've brought it out several other times, but the systematic theology helps to organize the gospel. Yeah. And so we've talked about um, 
we've talked about God. We've talked somewhat about his holiness and tried to build up God um, as far as who he is. We've looked at his uh, decrees, his work and creation and providence. We've looked at um, the being of God, the Trinity of God. And so we've elevated God to say he is utterly different. And then we've talked about man. And what we're trying to do in these uh, discussions on man and sin is we're trying to show the chasm or the gap or the distance between God and man. Yeah, and ultimately, good. right, we're pointing to, we want to get to Jesus. We want to get to the gospel. We want to get to um, the doctrine of salvation, but we're, what we're trying to show is the distinction between God and man and the need for the mediator, for the God-man, Jesus Christ. Yeah. And that's what systematic theology allows us to do. It allows us to organize all of the text um, around these doctrines to build that chasm so that now we can heighten and, and um, emphasize the cross. Right, yeah. So uh, as we start working our way into homardiology here, uh, we'll look at where that word comes from and what it means. Um, as we have the backdrop of God's holiness that this doctrine is really set before, when we're talking about the sin of man, that's in comparison to the purity and the holiness and the righteousness of God. Um, his character is absolutely spotless. And as we work through all of these texts today, we're going to see that man's character is not yeah, spotful. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> is not spotless at all. So, TJ, take us through uh, homardiology in terms of where we get that word uh, and, and what that word means. Yeah, the the word homardiology comes from the Greek word um, hamartia. Um, which is translated as sin. So we, we did a series on anthropology. Uh, that comes from the Greek word anthropos, so the study of man. Uh, in the same way, hamartia, the Greek term, uh, that is translated as sin. So as you mentioned earlier, this is the study of sin, um, the doctrine of sin. And what's funny is when you start thinking about us building these series, it makes perfect sense to do a study on the doctrine of God, who God is, and even to an extent on the doctrine of man. We talked about the, the necessity of that, kind of the self-importance and self-analysis, um, and you get excited. Like, I, I don't know about you, but when we come in, certain episodes, like, really get me excited to talk, you know? Uh, sometimes they surprise me, like the Image of God one. We've talked about that. Like, I right, was not yeah. ready for how yeah. cool that was going to be. Yeah, that was um, good. You know, but this, like, why are we having a conversation about the doctrine of sin? The, the conversation here. Why yeah, I, mean, I mean, it's not a flashy episode, right? Like, like you said, right? Yeah. This isn't your suit and tie episode. Right. It's more like we're just getting dragged through, you know, <laughs> an oil pit here. Um, yeah, but, I'm not beating my chest saying, let's go, <laughs> you know, let's talk about sin. But it, but we have to, right? Yeah, it's a, I mean, it's an absolute necessary component to an understanding of the gospel that we talked about in episode four. What is the gospel? We talked about those four categories. Sin is one of the main categories of the gospel, mm. and it has to be defined clearly in order for salvation uh, to be put on the uh, on the forefront. Um, so l let's work through a couple definitions for uh, sin. Uh, we, we pulled together probably, I don't know, six, seven different bullet points to kind of outline mm -hmm. what sin means. Um, without getting too formal in the definition, which weren't you reading in one of the systematic theologies earlier today, maybe, or the day before, about kind of the technical work behind the, yeah. the, the definition for sin? There's there's a, there's a lot that could be said. Like some of the terminology involved, I guess, yes. is super weighty. Yes, and, and to a degree, I guess, it could be helpful, but that's not necessarily going to be our task here, right? Like we just, when I think about what is sin, um, how do we, how do we, broad strokes just kind of conceptualize this idea i think like there's kind of this inherent understanding like okay i know what sin is because i've experienced it i can see it i know when i you know it when you see it you know kind of that mentality right but how would you actually define it well the first thing i would say is it's a it's a moral evil it's something that is um there's there's it, there's no neutrality to it it's an absolute um, rejection or rebellion or failure to uphold the standard of the law of God. Right. What would you What would you yeah. add to that? How yeah. Would you so it starts that? with God's standard. It's yeah. a moral evil that's against His standard. Uh, it's a failure to fulfill uh, His revealed law. Um, it, it goes against His nature. It goes against His character. 
Uh, and it goes beyond like a, a physical act, by the way. Mm. Um, now, of course, committing adultery is sin, but even the desire to commit adultery is sin. So we're not just talking about physicality, although that is a major component of it. It actually goes much deeper to that, even down to the core of humanity, right? Yeah, and I, I think I would add to that, and I really liked what you said there, and I would add that there's a distinction to be made between sin and sins, right? Like we commit sins, but we have a heart that is characterized by sin, right? Like that sin is at the root of who we are. And so like we've said this before, we aren't sinners because we sin, rather we sin because we are sinners. Um, so it's this sinfulness, it's this disposition, this inclination towards rebellion, towards wrongdoing, towards selfishness, towards pride, uh, towards rejection of God's standard. Um, and and you, we mentioned the, the phrase, it's a moral evil. Um, that should be distinguished between like a natural evil. So things that maybe come up and like natural disasters. That's not sin, although that may be part of the effect of sin, right? right? But sin is a moral, like there's there's a decision that's made. There's something in the heart that is pulling you um, towards that evil disposition. Yeah. Yep. I, I would just add to that any lack of conformity, active or passive, to the moral law of God. And we're ta- again, we're talking about the inner disposition, we're talking about the thoughts, we're talking about the desires, and of course, we're talking about the act itself, mm-hmm. right? Um, so would you, you would even say then, you know, active or passive, you would even say that failure to do something, even if I'm not acting, even if I'm not acting in open rebellion, but whether, rather I've failed to be obedient, right? Right, like that there's a, there's a passive nature you know, sins of commission versus omission type of distinction. You would, how could you flesh that out a little bit? Well, we're, we're commanded to love God and love our neighbors, right? Well, I, I can't do that perfectly, even even in, in in a passive way. I can actively pursue God and the gospel and Christ, and actively pursue loving others, but I I can't fully fulfill that every second that I live, mm. right? But I, I'm not I'm not intentionally not loving God. Right. It's just not a possibility for me to do that 24-7 every day that I live, even after conversion. Mm-hmm. That's the, that's I, I don't the know inherent, if that's what... You, yeah, no, that's really good. That's the inherent sinfulness within us that um, even though we are not willfully rejecting and openly rebelling against God in a particular moment, there's an incomplete and uh, in ineffective submission to God's perfect standard. Right. Right. Like to live up to that per- perfect love of God. Right. How do you perfectly love God? Well, maybe I'm just sitting there watching TV. I'm not doing anything rebellious, or but am I perfectly loving God in that moment? That's that's the right. issue. Right. <laughs> that's the question. Um, yeah. Maybe. I mean, maybe we could add to this discussion. Even in the Old Testament, the Old Testament handles some sins differently, mm-hmm. right? Um, in terms of sins that are committed intentionally or unintentionally, right? Right. Uh, so e- even the Old Testament recognizes the nature of man, the sinfulness of man, even in terms of intentionally, willfully sinning, and then even committing sins with, right. Yeah. Didn't mean no to. No intent. I did right. not mean to do right. that. Was, didn't realize that's a, that's what was going on. That's a, I think that's a good observation I mean, that's how, there. That, I mean, that's how bent we are. Yeah. Like, exactly. I mean, we're, we're sinning unintentionally. Like, we may not even be aware of it. And that's how, that's how grossly separated from God we are, and that if he did not tell us those things, we would still not know that we were in sin. You know, he, he reveals and says, look, when this stuff happens— you may not realize it, but your your heart is just bent. You you you're, you veer, uh, prone to wander. Lord, I feel it. You know, like I just ah, I'm just my my heart wants me to go the other way. Um, and on that note, I mentioned the heart. Let me ask this question: Where does sin actually occur? Um, where, where's, where's the root? Where's it showing up? Because we wanted to make a distinction between sin and sins, and make a distinction between um, the acts and the heart behind it. So. Where would you say, um, you know, we've talked about the uh, state of man and, and you know, his, his composition. Where does sin actually occur within man? Well, Scripture contributed, contributes it, um, sin, that is, to taking place in the heart. Mm. 
we've mentioned before on the uh, podcast that the heart is deceitful, it is sick, it is desperately wicked, Jeremiah 17. Um, the thoughts and the intents of the heart were evil continually, the early portions. Is that Genesis, Genesis 6? 6. Yeah. Uh, I mean, so uh, the Bible identifies the heart as the issue. It, it's a, when, <laughs> Students over the last you know, decade and a half at Liberty, they hated hearing it's a hard issue. <laughs> they hated hearing that, right? Did but, you say that a lot? No, I don't, I actually, I don't think I personally said that a lot, but it, it was just said uh-huh. a lot throughout school. Um, but, but, in, but in reality, how true is it? Mm. it? It is a heart issue, and that's, I mean, that's how the Bible defines it. Yeah. I, I love what James chapter 1 says, let no one say when he is tempted, I'm being tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted with evil, and he himself tempts no one. So we would say uh, there's a complete separation between God and sin. God is not um, responsible for sin. We discussed that some in the Divine Decrees episode. Um, but he goes on, James goes on to say, but each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. And when then desire, when it has conceived, gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. So there you see the desire <laughs> rooted in the heart, rooted in the soul of man. Um, that is what tempts us, and that gives birth to sin. But we would say even that desire is sinful. And the sin that manifests out of that, ultimately, James says, is what leads to death. Yeah, and it's interesting here. A couple more comments uh, that, that I think we can make on this. Uh, at the beginning of verse 13, you know, James writes, Let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God. Which I, I think that implies that people had been saying that. Yeah, well, that we want to say that we want the out. Yeah, yeah. so even within his, his, op- his opening argument here, it, he's already having to correct what the sinful heart wants to do. The sinful <laughs> heart wants to go ahead and blame God. Right. And, and then, of course, you know, he brings clarity to that issue that yeah. God can't do that, like we mentioned at the beginning of the episode, uh, because of God's holy uh, character. Okay, so how else does the Bible describe sin? What are some other ways uh, that we can look into the scriptures, see what it says about sin, come to the right conclusion? Yeah, man, sin, sin shows up in a variety of ways. Um, there's lots of biblical language that points to sin. Um, and I think when you read scripture, when you've kind of got this, this is what systematic theology does for us, it gives you the lens to read in a way where you say, hey, I know that even though the word sin did not show up in this particular case uh, or in this English translation, that's what it is. That's what's at, at the heart of it. Um, one, of the, one of the phrases that the Bible uses frequently to describe sin uh, is this word that, that's translated as to miss the mark because mm. um, that's, in, in a lot of ways, boil it down, that's what sin is. Um, a literal reading uh, out of Judges chapter 20, verse 16 um, It says, among these were 700 chosen men who were left-handed, and everyone could sling a stone at a hair and not miss. So there's a precision, there's Mm. a perfection that is implied with this word. Um, And and so the Bible will frequently use that same verb um, to describe um, one who has failed to hit the mark that God has set, that this this perfect standard, this um, this love of God, perfect obedience, that we have failed to do that. We have missed the mark. Um, and, and what's really interesting and unique about this word is that you mentioned intentional versus accidental uh, mistakes or sins. This term carries with it um, a willful conscience decision to do so. So it carries a, an ability. If you said that a using this verb that you were not going to miss the mark, it meant that you were only going to hit what you were aiming at on purpose. Uh, if you were to miss the mark, it would mean I've intentionally not aimed where I'm supposed to. So I've, in, I've intentionally it's intentional. done it's intentional. that's attached to the word. That's there. attached to the word. Uh, it's not an accidental mistake. And so the Bible carries with it using this term a weightiness, a, a decision, um, even if it's subconscious. I think we need to be careful about that. Sometimes we may not realize um, that that's really what our heart is doing. Our heart is wanting self-gratification. 
You know, so even something like the the humble brag or the let me, I want to hold this door open because I want to hear somebody say thank you or I want somebody to see me do those things. It might look good, but the heart behind it is is selfish. It's wicked. It's self-serving, those kinds of things. So we can't brag about the 10 downloads Turns that we had for the last half. <laughs> Turns out we can't. Turns out we can't. Not with, not with pure hearts we can't. Yeah. Well, I, I like what you said there about attached to the word is this intentionality behind the sin because John chapter 3 says that men love darkness, mm. right? They, they, they absolutely love it. Uh, our, our, our sin is, again, it's, it's not that we don't want to sin. We love to do it. Mm-hmm. We're intentional with it. And I think if we're honest with ourselves, we can think back to numerous times where we, we have um, been creative in ways to let our sin manifest itself. Mm-hmm. Um, and yeah, and you justify it all yeah, kinds of absolutely. different ways, and you say, well, that's not really lust, that's not really pride, that's not really what, whatever it is, and, and this isn't really you gossip. Mean like the, you mean like the Game of Thrones justification? There you go, <laughs> right, yeah. This It's not really that bad, or, you know, I, I'm telling, really what I'm doing is I'm trying to find out, I want to tell you about this person so you can pray for them, right. but I'm going to tell you all the juicy details. Yeah. It's, it's gossip, but I can tell you, or tell myself whatever I want to make it seem legit, um, or I can tell myself that Game of Thrones is not really... Um, that, that's a, that's a separate issue. We we'll have to go down that road another Man. time, another episode. Um, but that yeah, you're get, exactly right. Get people hot. Yeah, you're exactly you right. We're, we're not trying to lose Goodness one of those ten gracious. downloads. Stay with uh, us here. Stay with us. <laughs> uh, okay, what else? Missing the mark. What other terms does the Bible use? Um, just real quickly that that maybe yeah, I, identify I, sin. I think of uh, transgression. He was wounded for our transgressions, right? Our iniquities. Isaiah chapter 53. Um, I mean, this, this type of language is all throughout Scripture. Mm-hmm. And I think as Christians, we, we need to use this language and call it what it is. Yeah, right. that's good. We need to call it what it is, and that's exactly what the Scripture does. That's good. That word transgression, I love this. It, it's, that word literally means to go beyond an established limit that God has set. So it's like, uh, like, like Mom says, don't, don't go past this line. You know, don't wa- and you just walk right over. That's transgressing. That's that's going beyond <laughs> what mom said when she said, "Do not come into this room. Don't cross that threshold. Don't do that don't thing." Don't make me tell you again. Right, like all those, and yeah. we we can all relate to that. And it's the same thing with God's law. Um, one of the, one of the words that I think best captures what sin is at its heart is rebellion. Yeah. Um, the, well, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. No, we did an episode on this on Luke 15. That's what we I talked was going to say. About the prodigal son, yep. Bo- both brothers were rebellious. <laughs> Sons, right? That's right? They rebelled against the father. It manifested Differently. in different ways, mm-hmm. but it, 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 nonetheless, it was rebellion. Yes, and it, that's the insistence that I'm my way is better. I'm going my way, rejecting God's way. Um, other words, disobedience. I, I liked what you said. Call it what it is. Um, there are times when when people blatantly do the opposite of what God says. They just flat out disobey because they don't want to obey. It's just, I don't want to do this. I'm going to do it my own way. Um, what, what other words maybe come to mind? Abomination. You see that all throughout Leviticus, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, God is laying a standard, and he says if you break that standard, it's it's an abomination in the sight yeah. of God. It's yeah. an abomination in the eyes of God. Yeah. Um, yes. Error we also see. Yeah. I mean, clearly there's a long list right. of ways to right. identify sin. I think we've belabored the point, but there's there's a, the reason why I think that that was worth a, a, a brief discussion is just because it carries with it. Um, there's weight to those things. The, the different characteristics or distinctions of those particular words uh, gives us insight into what sin is, right? Like this open rebellion, this rejection, this disobedience, a transgression, um, missing the mark that carries with it some of the defining qualities of sin. Um, so with that in mind, let's move forward and ask an even more fun question to discuss. Yeah. Anybody there? <laughs> anybody still, still with yeah, us? Yeah. I, I hope, I hope in all seriousness that we are not tempted to skip over this topic because of the, the significance of it. Um, so let me ask this question for next phase of discussion. What are the effects of, 
Now, we've talked somewhat about this, and there's some, some overlap and some connection with maybe the fall of man, but what happens to humanity? What happens to us because of sin? What do, we, what do we face? What do we deal with? How do we ca- characterize and categorize all of the different effects of sin? Yeah, well, I think we can, we can even side with the culture a little bit on this one in terms of even the culture recognizes that there's things you can and cannot do, mm-hmm. and there are different punishments and consequences for those laws, right? I mean, we're not even talking about the perfect law of a holy God. We're, right. we're just talking about basic laws of government, culture, and society. There are, there are consequences, mm-hmm. Um, and those would be natural consequences, yeah. right? Like those are just straight up cause and effect. You do something sinful, you do something wrong, <laughs> there are consequences. Yeah, yeah that's, that's easy to see. Breaking laws, whatever it is, yeah. criminally speaking. Yeah, speeding whether, down the highway, yeah. you got to pay a fine. Yeah. That's what happens. You get pulled over. Like you've done something, you've broken a law, now you have, you know, if you're a teenager and you talk back to mom and dad and they take away your cell phone and your car, your car keys, like you're grounded. Like there's punishment because you have acted out of, uh, you've rejected and rebelled against the authority. Uh, so there's natural consequences and you would, I mean, those same things, but you see that happen in the lives of people, um, people that we know and care about. You watch their lives, um, just fall into, <laughs> utter disarray and you go look if you would just adhere to what god has said you would save yourself from all these troubles like look at all the struggle you have because you continue to sin that's those are the consequences of that yeah look first john tells us that uh god's commands are not burdensome right god isn't laying out his holy law to beat people down Right. He's laying out his holy law as a reflection of his character and for the best way for people to live. Right. If everybody would just abide by the law of God, the world would be a much better place. Gosh. But but nobody's having it because of sin. Right. 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 Um, so in, in terms of sin um, and my relationship with God, what what does the Bible describe or lay out uh, for that category? Yeah. So you've got those natural consequences, which are they're they're not good. That's that's not good news. They're bad enough. Um, but there's a lot more significant consequences. And the, the first thing that comes to mind when you think about the, the um, distortion or the, the struggle between our relationship with God and man is that um, there's a, a, a now a divine disfavor, or like man has fallen out of the graces of God. Um, you can go all the way back to Genesis and you just use Adam senses this. Right, like when he he knows, yeah. and he what does he do? He hides. He bolts. Yeah, he doesn't want he doesn't want to be around, and he knows like dad's getting the belt kind of feeling, you know, like you just that that feeling like okay, I'm no longer in his favor. Um, and the Old Testament frequently uh, speaks of this strained relationship. Um, God is angry with sinners. He's angry with Israel. Um, and there's now enmity and hate between God and man. Where where are you taking us? Well, here? yeah, I, I was following along with you there, and I, you basically alluded to it in Psalm uh, chapter seven, or not chapter, because there are no chapters in Psalms, by the way. Psalm Thank seven. You. Yeah, that's good. Uh, verse eleven, it says, "God is a just judge, and God is angry with the wicked every day." Oh, yeah, that's that's what has happened. That's straight out that's of the what text, it says. right? That's what, that's what it says. Hey, while you're in the Psalms, the book of the Psalms, look over at Psalm 5, yeah. verse 5. Yeah. What do you got there? Well, verse 4 says, For you are not a God who takes pleasure in wickedness, nor shall evil dwell with you. Verse 5, The boastful shall not stand in your sight. You hate all workers of iniquity. Oof. You shall destroy those who speak falsehood. The Lord abhors the bloodthirsty and deceitful man. Okay, so what I've heard you say, maybe we'll come back and do a separate episode on this sometime. But what I heard you, know, you say, people are about to li- <laughs> people are about to hate you. Uh, well, what does God say here? He says he hates. The Bible says that God hates workers of iniquity. He hates the evil doers. He hates. It's not. Oh, God loves the sinner and hates the sin. God hates the sinner in Psalm chapter five. You better just stop. I know, I know, I know. God hates the sinner in Psalm chapter 11. 
We see yeah. the same thing. And, and again, I'm not trying to paint God out to be anything more than the scriptures are because what I'm trying to show and what I think, I, I think you'll back me up on this. I think you'll affirm me to say that God is now the relationship between God and man has been so strained that man is no longer in God's favor that there is now hatred between the two. Right. Yeah, you just said Psalm chapter 11. That's verse 5. I said chapter again. There's no <laughs> chapters in Psalms, uh, by the way, just to make that clear. But if uh, you say it, it's okay because apparently yeah, yeah, it, it's it true. just comes out. Yeah, verse 5, it says, The Lord tests the righteous, but the wicked and the one who loves violence his soul hates. Um, but, but, but this is the nature and the character of God. He can simultaneously hate sin, hate the sinner, but also for God so loved the world. That's right. Right? Uh, he, he has the capacity with his own character, character to do both and act on both righteously and justly. That's right. And that's a, that's a good balance there because the scriptures say both, um, and, and the love of God, I mean, Romans chapter 5, while we were yet sinners, his son died for us. Mm. So it's even though he hates the sinner, he still sends the son to die in the sinner's place. So there's a, there's a uh, distinction, there's, um, there's, there's both and are happening there. But what we need to recognize is that sin has caused a strain on, on that relationship. And it's not, by the way, it's not just that God hates the sinner. It's that the sinner hates God, right? We've talked before about Colossians yeah. chapter 1. It's a two-way street. Yes, here. like the, the man is at enmity with God. We are hostile in mind. We do evil deeds. Uh, we are alienated. Uh, we hate God. That's what Colossians 1 tells us apart from Christ. Um, what, what, what would you add to that? Yeah, man, I was going to go to Romans chapter 5. Uh, there are chapters in Romans, <laughs> just in case you guys didn't know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, for Rom- anybody still out there. Yeah, Romans 5.10 uh, says, For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God. So the That's Bible right. even you know, says that un- unbelievers are enemies yeah. uh, of God. Yeah, Romans chapter 8, if you flip over a couple of, uh, of chapters there, and Romans chapter 8, verse 7 says that for the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God, for it does not submit to God's law. There's hostility both ways, um, and the relationship has been severed. There's strain. There's no more favor. There's no more fellowship between um, God and man. So when we talk about the, the consequences of sin— Yes, I have to deal. I have to pick up the pieces of sin in my life, in the sense that I have to pay my fine, and I have to, um, you know, deal with the natural ramifications of of sin. But there's there's a weightier spiritual ramification. That is the the severing of that relationship between God and man. Um, that's heavy. I, I, I can't believe you just said that. That was, that was that was so good. How many traffic fines if I had to pay throughout my years? to get back in right standing. Mm. But there isn't anything that I can do to pay for my sins That's right. on my own, spiritually speaking. That's right. Right? Um, which is which is why this is so important to point us to the gospel, right? Like this is taking us to the cross. We have to know this. We have to get this um, to understand we're not, we're not just in this state of like, ah, oh, yeah, we, we've got some issues, but God can come kind of clean us up. Like, uh, uh-uh. we are we're enemies. We're at war with one another um, prior to being in Christ. But what can you do to make it right? Like, is there a work mm. you can do? Absolutely not. I mean, I mean that, that, that's what we're getting at here. Yeah. There isn't anything that the sinner can do to get back in right standing with God on their own that's right. by their own flesh. That's right. And, I mean, this is. You know, this is where we're going in systematic theology, but even, you know, here just in this episode that uh, there's hope for the sinner. Yeah. Right? Okay, let me, let's continue. Before we get there, yeah. Yeah, let's continue in this discussion. Not only is there um, a a severing or an impaired uh, status of the relationship between God and man, but what else does man face because of sin when it comes to their relationship with God? 
Are we talking about in the courtroom of God, or are we yeah. talking about death? But prior to death, in yeah. the courtroom. Well, man, man is guilty before yeah. God. Yeah. We understand that term guilty. We yeah. understand what is attached uh, to that. And, and the courtroom of God, one, you can't stand in that courtroom, but you, you are guilty before God uh, b- because of your sin. Um, you, you violated his holy law and you have not upheld his perfect holiness and you are deserving of punishment and not we're, we're not talking about you know a fine right right we're, That's right. we're not we're not talking about a little uh, probation or suspension yeah because you're not you're not sinning against a civil government you're right. sinning against the sovereign holy righteous perfect sovereign creator god i said right. sovereign twice but um that's not a bad thing i guess you know, there's a couple chapters in the psalms that we could talk about <laughs> anyway uh no that, that that's really good um because when you're guilty here's here's what's really important to recognize when you're guilty you owe something mm. there's something that's owed um because of your guilt um, in some cases, you owe community service, you owe a fine, you owe life, uh, you owe um, years of servitude or whatever that might be. But it, when dealing with God, um, the payment that is owed is eternal because it's an eternal God, which means one of two payments is, susceptible, is acceptable. One is an eternal, eternal suffering in hell. Um, the alternative is the sacrifice of the eternal son. Mm. Those are the only two uh, means by which uh, a, a sin, sin against an eternal God can be paid for. Yeah. And uh, and so there's guilt that is attached to us. And ultimately, where does that guilt lead to? According to Romans chapter 6, verse 23, death. Yeah. Right? So yeah, The consequence of sin is death, or the wages of sin is death. Uh, the book of Ezekiel talks about the soul that sins shall surely die. Uh, the, the Bible is clear that sin and death are, are linked together. Genesis 3, sin enters the world. Genesis 5, it's just naming off a bunch of dead people mm-hmm. and how long they lived, right? Um, so help help us uh, kind of flesh this out real quick here. What, what do you mean? So in, in Genesis 3, God says, on the day you eat of this fruit... You shall surely die. So he says, when you eat, when you sin, there is now death. And he equates the two. He connects the two. Um, but they don't actually die right away. Mm-hmm. So ha- are there multiple types yeah. of death? How do we answer that question? Yeah, there are multiple types of death. We've got physical death. We understand physical death. Uh, we also have... Is that is that because of sin? Oh, yeah, I would argue, okay. yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah, absolutely. So the decaying of my body, the fact that I don't stay healthy, the fact that um, I get old and, I, you know, my body starts to shut down, and then I, I eventually, that's because of the effects of sin. Absolutely, okay. absolutely. The Bible's clear on agree. that. Yep. Uh, there's also spiritual death that also took place in the garden, Genesis 3. Uh, and there's also eternal death. Um, and the Bible speaks of that as well. Uh, there's a couple of places in Revelation, I'm trying to think of them offhand. Maybe Revelation chapter 2 that talks about a second death. Uh, yeah, Revelation later, 20, I think, yeah, right? With the, re- uh, the millennium, yeah. talking about the second death that occurs. Um, don't, don't quote me on that. No, I yeah, right. I, think, I think, yeah, Revelation 20 is the other, other place where it talks about the second death. So death is mentioned in Scripture from cover to cover. But also different types of death, like, like, like we've at least tried to identify here. So we understand the physical aspect. Every person physically dies because they have sinned. Spiritual death takes place because every person has sinned. So, um, And that spiritual death is, the, is that separate. It's everything else we've been yeah. describing, right? Like yeah. that's the alienation, the hostility. Um, and we've talked before about how man, Ephesians 2, we're born spiritually dead. Jesus says, let the dead bury their own dead. Right. Like that's, that's, what does he mean? He means let the spiritually dead worry about those things. Mm. Death is the, the natural state of the sinful man. Right. Um, because of that sin. Um, so let me, let me ask you this. So we've got three kinds of death, physical, spiritual, eternal. Who, who can escape eternal death? Hmm. Or does everybody face eternal death? Look, we all 
Physical death, look, we're all going to die unless the Lord returns. Right. right? Okay. Spiritual death, well, we're, we're born sinners, right. so we're we already all, spiritually right. dead. Ephesians chapter 2. Do we all face eternal death? No. Um, eternal death is the final state. If, if left unchecked, spiritually dead, when you physically die, if you are physically dead and spiritually dead, you will be eternally yeah. dead. Right. right. Like you have the, the eternal second death that comes, and that is... Uh, we've discussed this um, on an episode of Annihilationism. Mm. It doesn't mean that you no longer exist. It means that there is eternal death and punishment that is attached to that. So those who are born again do not face that second death. Yeah, there, there's, there's an eternal life. Right. Yeah, there's an eternal state for unbelievers and believers. That's right. That's right. The the human soul is eternal right. going forward. Um so, Look, and we've yes, got episodes good. on that for uh, the Reformed Informants podcast lined up. That that's just later on down in our episode guide, right? right like exactly. Later Much on later down, on, right? When we get there, so we'll uh, talk about that aspect of eternal death, right? In, in way more detail, right? In and, future episodes, and stay with us through the journey because the journey to get there will make those discussions much more fruitful, uh, much more applicable. Those kinds of things, right. so. Um, okay, what else do we need to talk about? We talked about some of the consequences, um, the effects of sin. You have those natural consequences. You have consequences that affect um, and impair man's relationship with God. And so we have this uh, this state of we've fallen out of favor. We have um, guilt that is laid on us, um, and now we're we're going to face death. Um, what other um, consequences or effects or, or things are worth mentioning as far as where we where we find ourselves now because of sin. Man can't do anything spiritually good. Um, that's because John eight forty four says you are of your father the devil and you want to do the desires of your father. We talked about that in John chapter three that man loves sin, man loves darkness. Uh, man cannot act contrary to his nature. Man cannot do anything good uh, apart from Christ. Like right now, I'm just thinking of that gif where that person's walking off, you know, with it. Did you, you know what I'm talking about? Yeah. <laughs> it's our go-to gif on Twitter. Oh, man, that's so funny. But but it's not, I don't mean to take, take it lightly no, here. No. I mean, uh, the Bible talks about this so readily. It's not an obscure text. It's not an obscure passage. I mean, this is on the forefront of all of Scripture, man has a serious problem. That's right. That's right. Uh, we've talked a lot about this in our previous episode, um, the fall of the depravity of man, um, just about all those effects. and all. The, now that we face this, um, we face this reality, we have the wrath of God, we're spiritually blind, we're spiritually... I mean, all of those things that, that happen there, um, and we are inherently sinful um, because of that. Um what else? What else do we need to discuss? Well, I think we've touched on a lot of components of this. Yeah, um, I, I guess I would add one one other thing that that not only do we face all of those things that we've already mentioned, but also just the the um, relationship. I mean, gosh, just turn on the news and log on to social media. Just relationship mm. between human beings, right? Like there's jealousy and strife and tension and anger and hatred and discrimination and um, failure to submit to authority and conflict, like all of the um, interpersonal um, aspects of human nature have been distorted and marred because of sin, Yeah. right? So, so even just the way that society functions, um, we have a police force and a and jails because of sin. We have a court system because of sin. We like those things would not exist if sin didn't exist. Right. We wouldn't need them. Um, so it just it, it it just permeates. It's how our whole world is set up. Yeah, and uh, as you were talking there, TJ, it it made me think of well, we're talking about the depravity of man, but well, we're not we're not saying that Christianity is behavior modification right good, when we good. when we get to the other aspects of, of of the gospel here because to some degree the world and the culture can give ways or points or put together a system to modify behavior but 
the world cannot actually give the remedy or the cure to fix and change the heart. That's Remember, good. Remember, that's because that's back where the episode started when, when you talked about sin, sin being described as taking place in the heart of man. Yeah. So that's that's what you were saying. The difference uh, between the actions and the heart behind it. The, right. The inti- so so cu- culture society can modify. Of course, our culture doesn't really do that, but society. And government can modify behavior and can correct some of the outward. Um, like now, I'm disincentivized to steal um, because if I get caught, I could face criminal charges. Right. But I still I covet. Right. I still have a desire, and 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 society can't fix that problem. Right. That's, such That's a good only point. the gospel. That's I'm glad that's you brought a good that example. up. That, well, I'm glad you brought that up, the behavior modification, because a lot of times that's what you see in churches. You see people who catch the culture and they come in and they know how to say what they're supposed to say and do what they're supposed to do. And there are probably people who listen to this podcast who do check all the right boxes, but the heart is still right. the, that's where the heart that's where the sin yeah. is. It's in the heart. Yeah, God takes that heart of stone right? And he makes it a heart of, uh, of flesh, right. right? Ezekiel chapter 36. That's so right. out of that new heart comes the sanctification. That's and then right. there, you know, you begin showing good fruit as right. opposed to that bad fruit. Yeah. Then you're not suppressing sure. those desires yeah, so much no, as you're allowing good. those new desires to mm. come to fruition uh, because you have a new heart with new desires that want to please God. Uh, and of course, you're still fighting the flesh, but there's there's a new heart in there and and the battle is different for a believer um on those on those fronts that's good man that i don't i don't want us to talk anymore about anything else because i think that's a good place to wrap up so that's good. let's let's do let's do an initiative something to take away uh, from this and then we'll wrap up yeah i'll i'll start by saying let the bible speak on this issue mm-hmm. again the same hermeneutic that we've used throughout the entire reformed informants podcast is the one that we're using here all of the different terminology all the different descriptions all of the different passages all the different texts all of those speak on this problem that is within the heart of man that we call sin let's call it what it is let's talk about it let's discuss it let's believe it but then let, let's also look for hope in christ um, which is the, you know, second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth part of the gospel. That's right. Uh, gospel message. That's right. Man, I would echo that exact same thing. And I would say that there's a seriousness to sin. There's a there's a reason why we had to spend an episode talking about this. And we're going to, the next episode I'm really excited about, talking about the doctrine of original sin and how that's connected to all of this. Um, but the seriousness of sin is ultimately to point us to that need uh, for a Savior. And so when I look at this doctrine of sin, I'm just reminded of the grace of God. Like instead of me dwelling on just how awful my heart was, and still I fight my sinful desires, what I see is how gracious and merciful God has been to save me out of, mm. despite these things. When we read Psalm chapter 5 and Psalm chapter 7, or Psalm 5 and Psalm 7 and Psalm 11, um, when I'm reading through mm. those, I see the love of God for His uh, for His people, that He has said, I'm going to save you despite these things. And that, man, there's just a, there's just a glorious gospel to be, to be had there and a glorious God to be praised yeah. because of those things. That's good. If you're not doing so already, make sure you subscribe to our podcast on iTunes and to our YouTube channel. Be sure to like us on Facebook at Reformed Informants. Follow us on Instagram and Twitter at R underscore Informants. And as always, you can find access to all of our episodes and links to our social media platforms on our website at www.themajestiesmen.com slash Reformed Informants. If you have any questions or suggestions for topics of discussion, feel free to email us at reformedinformants at gmail.com.